Big Step Foundation. I now request Mrs. Mr. Marubara to come on stage, please. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to Carnegie for inviting me. I think the topic of this year's GTS, Global Meets Local, is very apt. In a way, due to unforeseen and unexpected events in one part of the country, in one part of the world, the whole globe has got hammered, right? And success in vaccines in one part of the globe can affect others. So willy-nilly, global is meeting local. In addition to that, the focus of the conversations that I heard yesterday on digital infrastructure, emerging technologies, uh, general cooperation and digital sovereignty also, I believe, are very, very relevant. Can you put on the deck, please? Ah, OK. So it's visible to us? OK, perfect. So the, while the context of my talk is very specific and local, specific to education, it's local to India, the applicability, as you will see in the next 20-odd uh, minutes, is global. And it is across sectors. This headline is well known. But every time I see those numbers, they still continue to awe me. How does a country provide quality learning outcomes for these many students with so many teachers, so many languages of instruction, across so many administrative setups? Each of those 60 boards of education are autonomous. Nobody can tell them what to do. They all decide their own curriculum, right? And mind you, these are just mediums of instruction. We have hundreds of languages and dialects. I like to joke that when you're dealing in Newtonian physics, it's applicable up to a some level. But when you enter the quantum realm, all the assumptions collapse. So any assumption about a tech anywhere around the world start to collapse when it meets the scale, complexity, and diversity of India. Education in India is complex, not the least, because India itself is big, diverse, and complex. I have deep personal and professional experience of this as close quarters. I have lived in seven states, east, south, west, north, and my wife has lived in five, six other states where I have not. So between us, we have covered 12 states. So I've seen the diversity of cuisines to begin with, linguistic, cultural, habitual, and professionally, after I left my corporate and entrepreneurial world behind, I had the fortune of being part of the startup team at Aadhaar. That's when I understood scale. There are some government offices here. You routinely handle this kind of scale. But for us from the private sector, we don't understand scale until you understand how the, the scale of India and how what the government offices have to deal with. And Aadhaar, as you know, was also a very powerful example of leveraging technology. My role there was to understand how do we create demand for 1.3 billion Indians to voluntarily walk, give their data, and get a number? Right? It is also my honor and privilege to have led the team that named it Aadhaar. As I like to joke, it's the third word my younger son learned after mommy and papa. <laughs> As we're cycling through many words. And the choice of Aadhaar also had to fit in India's diversity. It's one of those rare words that exists in many Indian languages, and it means the same. And Aadhaar, as you know, does one thing and only one thing well. Are you who you say you are? This experience of leveraging technology in the Indian context left a deep impact, not just on me, but several others from the private sector who were fortunate enough to work on it. So in 2015, we started XTEP Foundation. Uh, my co-founders in it were Nandan Nilekani, Rohinin Nilekani, you would have heard of them. And the idea there was inspired by our Aadhaar journey 
and inspired by a lot of the philanthropic work in education that Rohan Nilayakani had, had done, how do we reach out to 200 million children and give them access to improved learning experiences? As you can imagine, for those of us from the tech world, when you go into education, your first thing is tech first. So we tried everything you could have thought of. Personalized learning, artificial intelligence, uh, immersive content, AR, VR, app, platform, this, that. Very soon we hit a wall very, very fast. Thankfully, we used to do a lot of user research that taught us a lot. In one of those user researches, this mother told us, look, all this fancy learning games is very engaging. I see my child engaged. But this is like the pickle with the meal. This is not the meal. It makes the food interesting, tasty. These games make the learning engaging, but this is not learning. So then that got us thinking. What are the mindsets about learning? And in the next few months, we totally looked at something we had missed out. Some of the most powerful technologies were right under our nose, and we were not thinking of leveraging it. The humble textbook, one of the most powerful technologies created in education. Second, language being the first, but that was created 50,000 years ago, so I won't talk about it. As we look back at the textbook, we realize in the Indian context, there's lots of it. There's an abundance. As a country, we print a billion textbooks every year. And as you know, in the context of India, books are sacred. While the education system is very, very complex, lots of actors, the one thing that connects everybody is textbooks, right? Everybody teaches from the textbooks. Every child has a textbook. The government gives it free of cost. The syllabus, so it's the whole system revolves around the textbooks. Rather than comment on the content in the textbook and the outdated nature of textbook as a technology, we asked, can this be leveraged? Can we leverage what is abundant rather than worry about what is scarce? And thus began the idea of putting unique number QR coded in textbooks. To be fair, it was not the, the idea was not new. What was new was designing it for 200 million children. How do you design it for the scale, complexity, and diversity of India? So as we tested the idea, needless to say, and we went back to mothers, they told us the equivalent of now, this is the meal with the pickle. Because you have a textbook which is trusted. In that textbook, at a certain point in time, if my child wants extra content through the QR code and some app or whatever there is, I can get extra content. This I will bless. And we spoke to governments and they also liked it. And that's how we know that the idea was powerful. But designing for scale is something else. We leveraged what was working here which is a combination of three technologies came together. Textbook, very powerful, very familiar. Phones, familiar, and QR codes, which after demonetization of 2016, became ubiquitous. So three technologies, independent, when you, when you bring it together, it achieves an effect that we call as strangely familiar, yet mind-opening. And that is the nature of many disruptive technologies. They are strangely familiar, and yet, once you see them, it's difficult to unsee them. Once somebody has seen QR-coded textbooks or what energized textbooks, it's difficult to unsee. And the question is, why aren't all textbooks QR-coded? So this designing for scale meant XTEP Foundation created a technology, which I'll talk about later. The government of India created a platform on the back of this. Government of India's platform, they offered it as uh, infrastructure for the whole nation, for all the states. Who would then use that to decide where to put QR codes, what kind of QR codes, what content to link to, everything autonomous as per the federal structure of India. And then the child would, or the teacher would use it with an app or a whatever device. In essence, what we had created was the GPS of learning. Something as simple as a, G, as a QR code in a particular point in a textbook, when used with an app, 
is sending a signal, I am here in this textbook at this topic and I want content. No different from you asking for Uber, pizza, whatever. Right? And now it is what kind of content should be there is the choice of the trusted authorities. The same authorities who are responsible for the textbooks. So you know it won't be inappropriate content. Right? It may not be the best of content, but it is very, very relevant and highly trusted. And trust and habits play very, very important roles in education. So with the GPS of learning, what happened in a matter of three years, the first there were four or five states like Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, they were the initial champion states. They said, we like this, we will implement this. And the government of India said, yeah, go ahead. Diksha was the platform. So they started energizing textbooks and connecting it to content. Within three years, that number of five, six states went up to 35, 36 states and union territories. As of now, 600 million textbooks have been printed on an average of 15 to 20 QR codes. So think about it. There are 12 billion GPS points out there, which when triggered gives a sense that what kind of content is being asked in what context. Diksha does not collect any personal data of children, so you do not know who, so just have a sense of what kind of content is being asked for. The, like you know with GPS, whether you use it on Zomato to order a, a food or Uber to order a cab or whatever, the context can be different depending upon the state and the subject and the textbook. Whether you are using it for to provide content in the official medium of instruction or in certain cases like Madhya Pradesh in the local tribal dialects, Gond, Halbi, we do not even have a language but you can have interactive content in that or in states like Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Urdu where the script is from right to left, right? That's how we have content in Diksha on 33 languages, many of them are dialects. Right? And each state decides what language they want to put it in. There's also content for the visually impaired, for the hearing impaired. Right? For the hearing impaired, it's in the Indian Sign Language. And there's content created around it. Content around quizzes, assessments, explanatory content, uh, problem-solving solutions, assessments, quiz, uh, uh, various learning games. Right? Games that, when you play that game, you learn concepts of maths. And this can be consumed online or offline, phone or desktop. In different states, they had different ways of using it. In some st more of the more developed states, they would have projectors in class. They would project the content. In some cases, they would not. The teacher would use her phone to, for example, to a poem is brought to life with someone singing it out and the children are paying attention. In other cases, in some states, they provided tablets, three, four uh, children, one tablet. So again, the, it's, it's the federal structure. Each state can do what it wants to do. And all of this on a government of India laid highway. The use cases, we had teachers saying that, you know, when you're sitting in the staff room half an hour before a class, we just watch a few videos. Some children are saying before the exam, I revise my concept. Some teachers are saying there are certain concepts that are very abstract. This is useful for us to understand and then explain to them. For some, it is how do you pronounce certain words, right? And when you hear somebody saying it, you can understand, especially in English. An interesting thing that happened was once the QR codes were there, states realized that they need more content, better content. Then they reached out to NGOs. The demand for better content increased. And as part of that, there was a program which the government of India created called Vidya Dan, again using a piece of technology, through which states could crowdsource content in a controlled manner. Because finally, they are responsible for every digital content that is connected. So, as 
technology solved certain problems it created a demand for new kind of solutions and that new technology came in to solve it so this is the nature of technology it creates supply that supply creates demand for new technology and new technology comes in to fill that this cycle is ongoing and uh, it's as i said it's a third year there's still a lot that can be improved but it's a very very exciting thing you can see the numbers of reach right and as as i said xstep foundation had a goal of reaching 200 million it would not have happened if we did everything ourselves but by the ecosystem coming together ngos providing content xstep and others providing technology the government of india using its resources to create a platform and provide it the states using their teacher resources administrative structure this is a complex ecosystem where the complexity would have been the weakness for scaling up technology the same thing is now converted into an advantage where everybody in the ecosystem does what they are good at what they can do but the end result is improving access to learning experiences for the child in fact before energize textbooks another technology that was created was teacher training it was on diksha but there was no demand for it from the states because they had a face to face training and even though it was reaching 10 to 15% only every year of teachers they said yeah this is working what's the problem the problem came with pandemic so the in 2019 there was a very ambitious nishtha teacher training program that was rolled out but in 2020 you can't roll it out because there's no face to face but since the building blocks were ready since the solutions were ready states and the center could swing to action convert the training into online and last year 2020 two and a half million teachers were trained in 18 modules at a fraction of the budgeted cost and much faster than it would have been and interestingly as it was rolled out the first year last year the value of these digital certificates that you see teachers started to demand these certificates they would download it they would share it with their family and friends on whatsapp and uh, do you notice the qr code here it's the same technology from the energize textbook that building block was repurposed here right and the advantage here is it is not a fake certificate when you test check for that qr code it is verified by the respective state government that has issued it right so you know it's an authentic certificate and that's why the qr code is there i won't go too much into the details of it but the main thing here again was the design of this for scale it was not designed to work in one state and in the second state right once the basic program idea was in place how do you roll it out to the entire country in one shot and that is a design principle that we call as what works at scale thinking which is different from scaling what works there was a lot of data available of this but data available to the respective states right and so they had data on completion rates 80 plus percent and they realized that suppose it's a 45 minute course teachers on an average were spending 5 minutes per session but nine sessions a day so that gave them a sense that so they're consuming it in micro chunks whereas in a regular face to face it would have been one two hours so the content had to be redesigned keeping this in mind again it's an evol evolving process uh this year they expanded the scope of nishtha from just grades 1 to 5 to grades 1 to 10 and even uh, foundational literacy and numeracy so this year the expectation is around 7 and a half million of the 9 and a half million teachers would go through undergo digital training but keep in mind that the course for this is broadly laid out but every state can modify it to its own context in its own language roll it out as per its own needs and its own administrative structure structures and issue its own certificate again the power of digital infrastructure as opposed to solution the power of leveraging what is abundant and in this case teachers all teachers have a smartphone children may not but teachers have a smartphone so they could complete the courses in the comfort of their homes or wherever they were i've given you two stories of how technology was leveraged what is common to these two 
let's zoom out. We've seen the power of disruptive solutions over the last decade. A lot of them, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, name it, they all share same common building blocks. What is a building block? Anything which has a very specific identified purpose, but can be used in a variety of situations, can be combined with other building blocks and the value of that combined solution is exponentially higher than each building block. Where did the word originate from? Bricks as building blocks, we literally, right? Bricks are the building blocks of our houses. The other thing of digital building blocks is each can evolve independent of the other. And as each building block evolves, others can take advantage of it. By raise of, by show of hands, how many here have a cell phone which is five years old? Anybody? One person. Excellent. I would have been worried if there was nobody. Right? So, five years. We are replacing our phones that fast. Why? Because each component there is evolving every year. Better cameras, better software, better GPS, lighter phones, lighter materials, name it. Right? And somebody is just putting all of this together to create better, better phones. And the moment you use the phone, the demand is created for a better app, for better technology, for better cameras, etc. And next year somebody supplies it and the cycle goes on. That is the nature of technology. If used wisely, it, this speed of evolution can be an advantage. If not used wisely, we will always be paralyzed because by the time we have created a tech solution, it's outdated. This is not an exception with technology. This is how we have built houses. This is how we built our cars. A car is not handcrafted for you. It's not a monolithic structure. When your tires wear out, you don't replace the whole car. When you want to upgrade your steering, you don't replace the whole steering or the seats. You want to change the paint, you don't throw away the car. Building blocks have helped us. I mean, that is the default mode of which, in which we handle large, complex situations. Houses, right? You take the bricks, you take various building blocks, but create your own unique house. And that is an important point. In the era of technology, and we've heard the previous speakers talk about digital sovereignty. I cannot be held hostage by my choosing your technology, right? And therefore it's very important and building blocks help in that. I take what I want, put it together in the combination I want, but the platform is mine, the data is mine. And when I want, I can swap out a building block and, and upgrade it and replace it with something else. But there's not one type of building block. There are four types of building blocks. And often we confuse the two. Application, app, portal, that's one kind of building block. It's very, very context specific. So if you're using a Zomato app, you are using it to find food. If you're using Uber as an app, you're using it to find transport. But for Zomato and Uber, they are both platforms which have an app, right? It's the platform that is enabling transaction. It's the platform that is storing your data. That's, a, that's the, from the top, the second layer, platform. The third is code, Linux, open source. Somebody takes code, creates a platform out of it and offers a service on that platform. So that's the code as a building block. Right? Codes don't collect data. Codes, when used as platforms or as apps, they collect data. The fourth, standards, specifications, protocols. And as you see, as you go from top to bottom, you're losing the specificity of context, but you're gaining economies of scope. What do I mean by that? GPS is at the bottom. It's a protocol. UPI is at the bottom. 
So look at the range of applications of a GPS or a UPI. There are other common examples. SMTP, what allows emails to talk to each other, simple mail transfer protocol, HTML. Protocols are all around us. Once created and adopted, they create massive economies of scope. And as you're going from the bottom to the top, you lose the economies of scope, but you gain specificity. So thinking of these four as different kinds of building blocks allowed us as a step foundation to build on this and create building blocks with our philanthropic money as digital public goods. So we created this open source project called Sunbird, which is nothing but a set of carefully curated building blocks, each offering those services there. One of the platforms built on top of Sunbird using Sunbird is Diksha. It's a platform of the government of India. But to the left of it, you see two other platforms. Uday is a fintech learning platform of the government of Maharashtra. I got integrated government online training is a platform of the Department of Personal and Training Government of India to train civil servants. Each completely different. Context is different. But you notice I also put Covin. The question is, what is Covin doing in this? And that's where the fun of building blocks is. As I said, you can put together building blocks based on what is your intent, your context, and your scope. So if you see the big rectangle at the platform, the platform of Covin is built on a combination of Sunbird building block, Divok, which is a building block created by another philanthropic organization called eGovernments Foundation, and a bunch of existing specifications and protocols. And since Covin is both a platform and an app, it enabled other apps like Arogya Setu and some private sector apps also to link up with Covin so that you can now get your digital verified certificate, the vaccination certificate on multiple apps. The choice is yours. Right? That again is the power where the top layer of application is very, very context sensitive. The context of Arogya Setu is different from that of Covin if you're using that. And this also enables private sector led innovations. Let me, moving on, coming back to this, what do you notice is common to these three use cases? They're in different sectors, different workflows. What is common to them? Sorry? Yep, <laughs> visually, right? You notice the QR code in all three. No prizes for guessing. It's the same building block. But the usage and the context of the QR code is different. Each of you would be possessing, I'm hoping, this vaccination QR code, right? So when somebody verifies it, at some airport authority, you are using a piece of Sunbird building block. But the usage of this is very, very different from that of the child saying, I want content related to this. It's very different from that of the teacher who's saying, hey, I have finished your course. I can proudly proclaim that uh, I have this. Same building block, different sectors, different uses. And the specific solution put together in the context that makes sense. And the numbers, recently we celebrated a billion plus digitally verifiable codes. WW3 created this specification last year. In less than a year, India reached a billion and is now the world's leading issuer of verified credentials. UPI, you've seen what 50, 100 million QR codes in POSs have done, right? They revolutionized payment. There are 12 billion QR codes related to children's education in textbooks. Think of the transformative potential of that in the next, in the coming years. Teacher credential. Think of the simple application of this in the private sector where somebody can pay money to take a course, get credentialed and get a better job. Government teachers can use it to say, I've taken all your training. I now deserve the next posting, which allows governments to start thinking of merit-based uh, fast tracking of teachers or subject-based assignment of teachers. Technology, 
creates possibilities. Policymakers and humans decide how it can be best used. This is a personal favorite of mine because it is not a usual use case of technology. On the top left, you see a conventional situation where a child uh, is assessed and in some kind of a format, how many marks she got for each question, that's how it is there. If you see the thing, it's in Gujarati. At the bottom is the roll number of the child and the right is the initials of the teacher because you know, that's what gives it authenticity. But the problem there was for this data to reach the state for a larger analysis would take 100 to 120 days. What's the use of it? Because you are three months after that assessment. There's nothing you can do. So the problem was that identified was, can we reduce that time? And using a combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and some very well-designed apps, a building block was created where part of it was changing the sheet from the top to the bottom. Everything else is the same, but they just enter it that way. As a result, using an app, it recognizes the handwriting of the thing and connects the child's question, learning outcome, score, which allows the state to create a map like this, where the rows are performance by learning outcome and the columns are performance at a district level, which then when mapped gives the state a map of which parts of the state are doing well and where does attention need to be provided. From 100 days, because of this, and the teacher using an app, which is called Saral. So if you go to YouTube, you will find many teachers creating their own videos to explain to others how you can use Saral to quickly digitize this. Because teachers have to digitize it, and they have to correct it if the AI is not very accurate. It's not accurate 5% of the time. So they have to correct it, because it's their signature. Two days. From 100 days, it's now down to two days. So you conduct an exam on Saturday. By next week, at a state level, you have all this data. Now imagine what all can be done. You can see why are some districts not doing well. Why are some, what are the topics where all children are not doing well? The two main different things. Then the state system kicks in. Remedial content, remedial training, teacher training. A lot of the systemic efforts now come in because now the state can see. Once it can see, it can act, solve, and see the result of that. So again, a lot of possibilities are created. And in fact, other states are also replicating this. And here's a question for you. So if this building block existed, what other applications can you think of? Yeah, what else? Sorry? Health outcomes. Health outcomes. Anything where somebody is writing something on a form somewhere, right? It doesn't need to be entered by a data entry operator who couldn't care, right? But the same accountable person comes back and goes through, right? Health, agriculture. And that again is the power of building blocks. Building it as independent of context, massive economies of scope, you combine it in the way you want, no different from Indian food, right? You mix and match and then, you know, I like spicy, you don't like spicy. So we, we know it works. Likewise, the QR code also has many, many applications. Can anybody else think of any applications of QR code? Sorry? Yeah, menu at a restaurant. Yeah, I was hoping more in the social sector. <laughs> Yeah, all kinds of vaccination, right? That is in the next two years, three years, you can see that happening. So that's what happens. Once you've seen technology work, the human mind starts to ask, where else can I apply? Passports. Entitlement, Entitlement of schemes, right? And you don't need to be a technologist. That's the beauty of it. Once you see something working, the question you're asking is, what capability is this giving me? Now, how do I use this capability in the context of my policies, my intent, my context, my capacity? 
and that's why this is a favorite use case of mine no personalized learning no art, uh, uh, but artificial intelligence right it's not about children teaching is happening the conventional way behind the scenes quietly sophisticated technology is being used to help the whole system understand and respond better so how can technology be leveraged i put down three learnings we have had as a foundation first never ever make people walk to technology it's a bad idea never ever make technology the master technology should be designed in such a way and the part of technology fitted into a part of a larger solution so that it blends into the systems that we have the institutional structures the habits the rituals the cultures doing it any other way is not a good recipe for large scale adoption in diverse context second as i said scale what works is not what works at scale and i've given some examples where right in the beginning you have to think of the scale and creating building blocks enabling others to build on top of it is a way of what works at scale scale what works is you do something perfect in one place and you're now replicating it over the whole country right often times that does not work because the conditions of the original pilot are not same in other places and third as i explained don't think of technology as this imaginary full stack kind of thing which will solve all your problems it's a component pick up a screwdriver it's a component you use cash in a scheme it's a component right all of these are components and technology is also a component you need content you need policy you need resources you need people you need institutional structures so many things have to come together for technology to work at the scale and the diversity that is needed if the last 5 years as rudra was saying earlier was volatile the next 10 years believe me are going to be very very volatile we know that the whole range of technologies coming in and there will be a series of disruptions but rather than be worried about i don't understand this technology or that technology here are some suggestions by the way ek step as you know is one step is what we coined to acknowledge that every journey of a thousand miles begins with that one step and understanding the nature of technology is a good first step to be able to leverage it think components and building blocks think evolutionary and combinatorial think it is humans who use technology who disrupt technology does not disrupt it's a myth humans like some technology they use it they disrupt and the way this happens is there's a supply of a certain capability through technology humans like it they adopt it but in using it a need for more technologies and a more refined need comes up more technology comes this is how technology both grows evolves combines very quickly shape shifts morphs and before you know it something that was you know who for example when gps was first invented the us top military person was told all gps does is it tells you where you are and he said how stupid i know where i am right why would that be difficult no but that's what it does it tells you where you are the prob the power of gps with internet with devices is the combinatorial impact we've seen how that's changed right so while each of those technologies like crypto blockchain the web 3.0 itself could be disruptive think of the combinatorial impact of that right and coming back to india we have demonstrated in the last 10 years that there's a certain way we can use technology for developmental purposes aadhar upi direct benefit transfer uh, fast tag if you have used that right many other such things we have demonstrated that we can take the best of global thinking best of global technologies and use it to solve our problems in the process creating innovations which we are happy to hand back to the world so global meets local local meets global 
I personally find this very exciting. Of course, there is nobody who's indifferent about technology. People love it, people hate it. But what I find powerful is the power of the human mind to imagine a vision, to imagine an end state. And then use technology to navigate us through the all the opportunities and the threats towards that goal. In doing so, I believe we will go towards a technology dividend and not a technology divide. Three letters separated. But in those three letters is a mindset, right? That I will use technology to serve my means. And I will use it as the dividend, no different from population of India, which in the 70s till the 70s was considered a, a curse. Now we know it's a blessing. And I would urge you also to think, imagine the most powerful force on this planet. Use your imagination and technology will do your bidding. Thank you. That was just absolutely fantastic. I have to confess, I've seen a part of this presentation before. And when us at Carnegie, we saw this and we spent a lot of time thinking about the way in which Shankar and Ekstep framed the solutions that he talks about and the human-centric approach, we were just blown away. We spent much more time with his team and we're just absolutely delighted that we could get you out of, I think, Masuri this time, <laughs> otherwise Bangalore, to come and spend time with us here. I'm going to just open the room for questions, but the first one I'm going to ask you is, what's the next step for Ake Step? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, there's so many things to be done in education. But I believe as a result of the work of the past few years, as a country, the government of India and the various states have created these digital highways. And the pandemic has not helped us there is serious learning loss that is there. It has set us back a lot. Now, I think the focus should shift from access to content to figuring out learning levels and how do you improve them. The focus should shift to how to use technology to solve learning levels at the earliest possible. How, do, how can you use technology to tell people that not everyone needs to grow up to be a professor? You can learn skilling Right? And the new education policy talks of the academic scaling connect. How can technology help bring the national education policy to life? Uh, so there are many, many challenges. And I, here is a dream I have. In 2009-10, when we started working on Aadhaar, and there was this whole thing about financial inclusion was a big problem. Right? And we discussed in the other day, 2020, people don't really talk about financial inclusion anymore, right? We seem to have solved it. And that's a whole earthquake model. For a long time, nothing happens, and then boom, one day. I'm hoping something similar will happen in education by 2030, right? Where we've had a full decade of, uh, of working on NEP, leveraging the technologies. We have to solve our learning outcome problem in the next five, max, 10 years. And there's a lot of work that's happening. I think yesterday the minister talked about it. There is, you know, on top of Diksha, there is NDR, and now, uh, interesting thing is other countries are now asking for India's experience. And the good part for them is not only the experience, but even the technology is open source. So the, they can take the technology also and use it. And as the uh, Honorable Minister External Affairs said, that that is now India's time for leadership. We are in the thick of a lot of conversations, but we are a small foundation, so we try and keep our head above water. So one question I want to ask you, and if anyone has any questions, you can just raise your hand so I get your gaze. Um, in 2015, you created Xstep. You're a technology company that's quite unusual because you realized that what you were doing was not working. You went back to the blackboard and started speaking to actual people. 
and you realize that it's not about creating a platform or aggregating, but it's about decentralizing. And as you now say, it's about building blocks, which is adaptable to many different problems. But that realization, for instance, must have been, in a sense, also quite expensive and scary. So can you just give us a sense? Because a lot of technology misses the mark, but then people just stay with it. Yeah. So can you give us a sense of those moments? Yeah, it's an excellent question. In fact, the technology did not fail. What we realized was, even if it succeeded, we could not reach 200 million children. If our goal was 2 million children, any, which is a decent uh, goal for any NGO, that technology would have worked. But we had set a goal of 200 million, right? And as I like to say, you can't put together 20,000 ants and create an elephant. So designing for an elephant is a fundamentally different thing from putting a lot of ants together. So we realized that we are not getting to 200 million this way. So we, I would like to think it was learning, but we wasted millions of dollars in expensive content, in expensive technology, all the latest uh, buzzwords then. And we realized that this is not what our, our kids want, this is not what our parents want, this is not what our teachers and systems want. And then the human-centric thing started. But yeah, the research was, again, I come from the private sector where uh, if you don't research your way, there's a lot of wastage. So it was inherent and instinctive. And these were consumer researchers, these were qualitative researchers, these were researchers into attitudes, mindsets. And that's when we uncovered that the role of trust in education. So hypothetical question, you meet a friend who says that there's a great new doctor, you might switch your doctor. You meet a friend who says there's a great new school, you're not taking your child out of that school and switching, right? That's because it's so, trust is so ingrained into it. And it's very, very difficult to create trust overnight, very easy to break it. So these we would not have realized, no matter what we think of books, they are very highly regarded, teachers, our authority figures, schools. We entrust our kids to random strangers in schools for five, six hours. Why? Because there's an accountability structure, right? This hit us in the face, and that's when we made the pivot. Better late than never. So, uh, and we had set a self-imposed goal of we want to reach 200 million children by 2020. So the combination of a massive goal and a, a timeline made us take quick decisions and uh, focus on what would work. And thanks to that instinct and pivot, India was, in a sense, able to create COVID in a matter of months or days because of the building blocks. Yeah, no credit to us. It's just that okay. some smart people realize that some building blocks are there and why not use it? But yeah, you're right. That's why, I, as an entrepreneur, I believe one must always be prepared to get lucky. And India got lucky with the presence of Deeksha during COVID for the children and the teachers. COVID could be created very quickly in a matter of months. And now, uh, yeah, so. Okay, we've got some questions. I think there's one back there. Uh, thanks, Rudra, for inviting uh, such a great panel of speakers. And uh, I'm Dr. Deepak Singh. I'm from RH and Kyoto. So I'm visiting India for some uh, research-specific work. Let's come uh, to the, uh, the kind of design, systemic design, which we are talking about, it's excellent, like thrilling. Uh, I want to know more about decentralized way of bi-directional learning. Like the app or the system itself is learning. Like there are some great amount of teachers and there are very smart students who might have smart answers, question answers and response to that. How we are learning. And last year when I was visiting India, so I overheard uh, a training session of a teacher in UP. Maybe it's done by you, I don't know. Uh, there was some question like, Pushti kariye. So, iski pushti kariye. Pushti kariye. So, he didn't get the word pushti. What is this pushti? So, maybe in the local dialect or lingua franca, we need to change a lot. Then comes the question of carbon emission. Like, there was a program of BBC, uh, English is fun. It was run in uh, Bihar in times of um, Bhojpuri and uh, Nagma and uh, this uh, MP, Manoj Tiwari, they were doing something. So in, uh, there is not always that uh, we can have this uh, way of independent way of teaching, but we can also have collective and uh, combining community radio and all this. So this is a kind of uh, thing which I want to learn. What kind of uh, team you are having 
like maybe educationists, psychologists, child psychologists who are designing the content. And one very specific thing, for a tribal kid in Dantewada, uh, I'm just coming, in Dantewada, if you ask him that what is the rate of guava which he or she is selling, uh, maybe he, might, he or she might be using unitary method. So what are the new methods of teaching which you are evolving? And again, coming to the same question, well, thank you very much. Chagar, if I can push you on that, yeah. on that question of what is your team and how do you build technology, you're from Bengaluru. Bengaluru is often known as a group of people who believe that you can code your way out of social problems. Right. Right? So how did you do it differently? Yeah. So, by the way, we are a very small team. We don't have educationists, uh, people expert in education, too many of those. And all the content, etc., are created by the states. The state authorities who are interested with this, they are the ones creating it. So, in Chhattisgarh and MP, they decide what kind of content works best for them. And that's how there is content in Halbi, Goan, and a lot of the tribal dialects there. So, that they have created, not us. We have Yeah, no, possibly. But uh, coming back to uh, your question, as I told you, we began with that mindset, right? We can code our way uh, out of any situation. And we realized that uh, that's not how education works. But the moment we realized that, we also realized that there is such a powerful ecosystem already out there working hard to solve it, right? Teachers, principals, I mean, teachers walk kilometers to reach a school, right? They not only teach, they cook, right? They take care of the child. Sometimes they are the de facto parents of the child, right? And administrators, they go out of the way to make sure uh, textbooks reach on time and uh, transport, etc. When you realize how complex education is, one gets out of the romantic notions of that great content that will change the child's education thing. Not happening, right? Day in and day out, a whole army of people around the child have to take the child to the school, educate the child, bring the child back, right? Day in, day out, month in, month out. It takes a decade. And then we know if something has happened or not, right? So the role of technology is very, very limited. If you zoom out and think of all the things that had to happen, go back to your own education days. Right? More than any, of course, we all remember that one teacher, one piece of content, but, uh, and maybe our minds would have blanked out all the hardships we went, <laughs> right? Uh, the only people I know who love talking about education are those who have passed out, right? <laughs> I've not come across any child who says, yep, I'm going to go to school and spend five, six hours, and it's hard, it's hard, right? And that's why we all have to come around to guide the child and mentor the child and, uh, make her go through this. So coding is a very small aspect, but it can have a very powerful multiplier effect. Everything is there. The whole concept, you, you know this field better, force multipliers and defense, right? Everything is there. One small thing comes, makes an impact. It multiplies the effect of everything, right? And of course, if you multiply zero by anything, it's still zero. But with our ecosystem, it's a massive number, right? So even a small multiplication using technology, the gains are tremendous. And of course, given our past experience in Aadhaar and a lot of other things we've been a part of, we have seen technology work and succeed. And each experience has refined our thinking. Uh, and we get better year after year. We still have a long way to go. Ankur, the lady in the front. Yeah. Just here. Uh, thanks so much. My name is Malika Aluwalia. I'm the regional director of a data and evidence organization called ID Insight. So I always find it very energizing to hear of instances where there's a lot of data that could be used for uh, data-driven decision-making. And I was uh, wondering, in all your work with various governments and education boards, can you give us an example of any uh, state government or education board that you found most willing to engage with the kind of heat map type data that you showed and make actual decisions on focusing resources or uh, you know, operational efforts as a result of that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, NCRT, all of them, of course, we're not talking about state-of-the-art 
uh, AI ML based analytics and you know teams of people pouring over. But by looking at it, they can get some basic things. Like I give an example. If a course is being finished in a day, 45 minutes, in five, nine chunks of five minutes each, they're thinking, okay, maybe next time we should do something with it. When they realize that a certain learning outcome is bad across, it turns out to be something which logically we know, for example, fractions, right? Then goes back to, you can't solve it just through better content for teachers. You need to solve it through teacher training, uh, through uh, maybe some physical way of explaining it. So this is happening, right? And as you know, in a large complex system, administrators have a lot of other things to do. Academicians have a lot of other things to do. And uh, so Uttar Pradesh, right? Uh, and we have a few other states in early states, but we are seeing it. And uh, it's very encouraging. So Shankar, we're out of time. And I'm aware of the fact that it's not just this audience over here. You get to have drinks and dinner in the end. There's a massive virtual audience out there. But there's one last question I do want to ask you. This is a summit that is co-hosted with the Ministry of External Affairs. Technology is now not only increasingly important, but I would say in many aspects, central to foreign policy making. You talked about you're in the field of education, maybe education technology. I don't know if that's how you define yourself. I'm guessing not. Technology and education. Technology and education. Yesterday, we heard Ritesh, NPCI, and a range of people talk about UPI. Again, a platform that was built by two or three individuals. And if you're in Bangalore, you'll meet those individuals in settings such as these. Um, how do we generally, in India, take the good work that you are doing at Ekstep, at Disha, and otherwise, outside of our borders, maybe in our immediate neighborhood, maybe in other LDCs? But how do we do it? Because UPI, in all fairness, they've done fantastic work, but we'd like to see some use cases now. I'm guessing when it comes to the work you're doing, it would be wonderful to see parts of Nepal or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh adopt this. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Again, there are a lot of conversations already underway. These take time. So last December, uh, Ministry of External Affairs with World Bank had organized a lighthouse project for African countries, where India was sharing its experience with Diksha, Sunbird, etc. That was with the uh, Anglophone countries. In fact, tomorrow is with the 24 Francophone countries of Africa, part two of it. And it's the same thing, right? Which is the uh, education ministry, the secretary and others will talk about what they've done with Diksha, how it fits to policy, and how, you know, not just the learnings of Diksha, the content in Diksha, the technology of Diksha, for that matter, Sunbird and other building blocks, they can take it. And World Bank is encouraging other countries because the critical thing here is about digital sovereignty. By using the Diksha code, the Diksha content, or say Sunbird, you are, each country is creating their own sovereign solution. The data is theirs, the platform is theirs. Right? They can mix and match like we have. Mm. And that is very exciting for countries. Mm. You are not, uh, it's not an RFP where you're procuring and you're tied to the vendor and all. It is, you can get a vendor, who can instantiate that for you. But it is your technology, it's your platform. So a lot of countries are recognizing the value of this. And in fact, I believe a month ago, there was a, a BRICS forum where India talked about Diksha also as a digital public good, which is available to the country. So it's happening. And I think the MEA, uh, MOE, Ministry of Education, others are doing a lot of thinking as to how the world can benefit from it. So I guess our only our hope, keeping to the theme, is that our local can generally become their global yes. in many ways, rather than their local, necessarily. But with that, Shankar Maruwara, thank you so much for spending the time with us at the Global Technology Summit 2021. We close for day two for those logging in from different parts of the world and those here. We start tomorrow at 10 past 10 for the third day of the Global Technology Summit 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for our patience.